Hey guys, we'll get started in about two minutes. giving everyone one more minute to join us. All right, so welcome to the Armanino and Lease Query Ease Your Adoption and Audit with Technology webinar. It's November 17th, 2021, and we're so glad you could join us. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. You can minimize or maximize your webinar pane during the presentation by using the red or orange arrow button. During the webinar, we also encourage you to ask questions. In the webinar pane, you'll see a questions box that you can use to type your questions in and click submit. Our presenters will answer those questions as time allows during our Q&A session or at the end of the presentation. Second, to ensure good audio quality, please check your settings to ensure the appropriate audio option is selected. If you are using a phone, please click on the phone call audio option, or if you're listening through your computer, then please click on the computer audio option. Also, we'll be sending a copy of our presentation deck and a link to our webinar recording within 48 hours after our webinar to keep a lookout and follow for the follow-up email from us. As a reminder, to qualify for CPE, you must Use your personal computer and log in with your unique URL. Stay on for the duration of the broadcast and actively respond to all polling questions. If you have any questions or comments, please submit any um, of them via our chat. And if you have any technical difficulties responding to our polling questions, please send an email to elevatelearn at armaninollp.com with your name and the date of today's session along with your polling responses. All right, so let's get started. So today's learning objectives are one, identify how to effectively plan, manage, and implement the necessary lease accounting changes using the latest technology. Two, determine the new reporting requirements and where your organization falls in terms of compliance. Three, recognize how the updated guidance will impact your company's accounting policies, KPIs, financial reporting, budgeting, and forecasting. And finally, four, discern the latest targeted improvements and their effects. So I'm gonna hand it off to Teresa Brown, a partner here at Armanino in the consulting practice. Teresa? Good morning, thank you. Um, I get the opportunity to uh, moderate this great panel of experts today. Um, joining us is Grant Lamb, a uh, partner in our audit practice, Tom Brunton, Managing Director in Consulting, and Amanda Payne, Technical Accounting Manager at Lee Square. Uh, so for today's presentation, let's kick it off. I'm gonna turn this over to Grant. Thanks, Teresa. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so we'll start by taking a look at the people in a company that may be impacted by the new lease standard. 
Um, I would say that generally with most new accounting pronouncements, it's usually just the accounting department that's primarily impacted. Uh, but this new standard 842 really impacts many different uh, departments and many different folks within a company. Um, so first, obviously, um, the accounting and finance department will be impacted. Let's move to the next department, please. Yep. So uh, these folks obviously will be primarily impacted. Um, accounting and finance will primarily be responsible for transitioning the accounting and for all aspects of financial statement reporting. So obviously really important for your accounting and finance teams to have a really good understanding of the new standard. Um, the procurement team could also be impacted. Uh, with 842, we need to start thinking about embedded leases and whether service contracts contain leases. So the procurement team may be involved with gathering service contracts to, uh, to evaluate whether embedded leases exist. And also going forward, you want your procurement team to be cognizant of the concept of embedded leases as they enter into new service contracts. Um, the fp and a team may need to be involved from a budgeting perspective, especially if you're a large company or have a large lease portfolio or the, have a complex lease portfolio. You may need to invest in um, software or retain outside consulting help. So these may be additional costs that the fp and a team may need to uh, budget for and of course the, the tax team may need to be involved from a tax planning and tax strategy perspective so a lot to think about uh if you're in the accounting and finance department uh, next department is the um real estate and facilities department yep so these folks could be impacted as well you know one of the common challenges that we've heard uh, that folks for folks have implemented is just gathering your leases into a central repository, especially if you have a large lease portfolio, this has been a very common uh, challenge. So this could be a task that could fall on the real estate team. Um, also your corporate real estate strategy could change because of 842. Uh, because of 842, having a longer term lease could result in a larger lease liability. So if you have any KPIs or covenants that could be negatively impacted because of having a larger liability balance, you may want to work with your real estate team that may impact the length of uh, the lease terms that you enter into. So uh, a lot to think about if you're in the real estate and facilities team. Next department, we have um, the IT department. So especially if you're going to be implementing any type of lease accounting software, then you want to make sure your IT department um, is uh, is involved. Uh, next department, please, is the legal department. I'm sure the legal department will find a way to be involved in some facet, um, especially during contract review. You know, based on this new definition of a lease, you potentially may be able to structure your contracts in a way that gets you out of lease account, uh, accounting and uh, you know, get you out of embedded leases. So if you're making any type of changes to contracts and going forward is entering new contracts, you may want to have uh, those reviewed and approved by legal. Uh, and then the last department is the uh, yeah, external stakeholders. You know, we talked about all the internal folks that could be impacted, but also external stakeholders could be impacted as well. Uh, starting with your bankers and your capital partners, uh, making sure they're cognizant of the impact they could have on your covenants. Uh, you, you know, you certainly don't want a situation where you're um, out of compliance all of a sudden because of a uh, accounting change. You know, that's not the intent of 842, but that can be assumed. So start those conversations with your bankers now. Uh, start meeting with your investors and you know, there could be big changes to your balance sheet and to your EBITDA and other KPIs so start preparing your investors for these changes now um, and finally don't forget about those pesky auditors you know they're they're going to be auditing your lease accounting especially in the year of implementation we'll be asking for a lot more support and documentation so just be prepared for the additional requests uh, but also use your auditors as a friend and resource. You know, use your auditors and leverage your auditors and consultants help you transition to 842. So a lot of folks in a company, this is a standard that's going to impact a lot of different uh, people within your organization. And, you know, the saying it takes a village really holds true for this new standard if you want to ensure a successful implementation of the new standard. Great. Thanks, Grant. Um, so I do have some questions for the panel here. 
Um, the first question I have for Amanda is, uh, so this is a big group of people, right? So you've been through this, uh, through this road many times. What's the best way to start this process internally? That, that's actually a really great question. So it really boils down to educating the company first. So educating, educating the company and the key stakeholders as Grant has described. Now, this will be more so of a continuous process, but it will be important at the very beginning to actually establish maybe one or two people considered to be a point person that's acting as the champion for adopting this new, new standard. And that person is going to oversee the entire organization and act as the liaison between various departments. So Grant actually explained that other departments will have a, a vital role. Well, with that point person, they'll be able to set up an internal meeting, discuss the changes that are getting ready to take place, and really explaining the significance behind it. I really feel like that sets the tone for the trajectory of your project if you have an understanding of what that looks like initially. Um, it's also going to be important for that point person to actually establish what the current process looks like. I can't tell you how many times I've talked with companies that really don't have a formal process as it pertains to leases. So that point person should be responsible for following up with the departments, understanding if um, it is necessary to establish a new process or maybe just align that a little bit more centrally across all the teams. So figuring out who's initiating the contracts, who's recording the journal entries, maybe the AP team, um, who's responsible for expirations. That's all going to be important for establishing this new process. And, and then really just asking each of those departments what's going to be important for, for them um, as it pertains to their leases. So will software be a, a best option for you? What will be those functional requirements? So I would say, again, starting out with establishing who that point person will be will be the best strategy. Great, thanks, Amanda. So that's the internal folks. Um, I guess for, for Tom and Grant, how, how can the company, once they've sort of figured this part out, how can they best engage, Grant, you mentioned, uh, you know, your friendly auditors, um, best engage auditors and consultants to help with adoption? Uh, I can start, Tom, if you like. Uh, you know, a lot of ways I think companies uh, can engage their auditors. I think the best way is to engage the auditors uh, early and, and meet with the auditors uh, often. Your auditors, if they're any good, should have a good sense of your business and should have a good sense of the size and complexity of your lease portfolio. So start with your auditors to get a sense of engaging how much of a lift your team will need to start uh, the implementation process. Um, and for many companies, your auditors may have copies of your lease agreements and lease schedules. So you may be able to leverage your auditors just to gather the lease documents necessary for the implementation. And Amanda mentioned education. Um, that's super important. So use your auditors, use your consultants to help um, educate your team to get you up to speed on the nuances of this new standard. Yeah, and I'll just jump in and kind of underscore what Amanda said, right, in terms of bringing everyone to the table and internally getting a baseline education for everyone. Um, so a lot of what I do is support people as they adopt 842 and RevRec and other things like that. And often the pushback we get is, well, this is an accounting standard, so we just need the accountants and the controller in the room. We don't need to worry about facilities. IT, legal, like, let's leave them, we'll, we'll tell them what they need to know. But a lot of times you need the context as to what the impact to 842 is gonna be, similar to what Amanda was saying, right? To, to tailor it to them, understand for, for how it's gonna impact them on day to day. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll echo Grant as well, I guess. I would say, assuming that you've been audited before, right? And a lot of the, the projects that we've been doing lately is with people going through first time audits as they're trying to mature and, and, and have that stamp of approval from the, the external parties. A lot of times the auditors know they've done your um, commitment and contingencies footnote, they've tied it out. A lot of times leases is a big, a big piece of that five year table. If it's a new auditor, you still wanna get them involved very early because you don't want something like leases to get to the end of the, the runway and all of a sudden they have massive disagreements with the assumptions or the, the judgments, right? The management's taken to get to that point. You, you wanna make sure it's smooth sailing and, and there's no surprises for, for anyone for, from 
you know, selfishly, I'll, I'll say from a consulting side, right? Say, similar with the auditors, similar with Amanda from, from Lee's query side. We've seen this happen, or, or we've seen these projects happen at a lot of different organizations as they've gone through the stages of adopting these pronouncements, specifically leases today. So we've seen where companies have done a really good job. We've seen where companies have done a really bad job, hypothetically, hypothetically, right? Where there could have been improvements made, how, how people have stumbled because of approaches or decisions that they've, they've made during the process. And so just leverage and lean on that because if you've never been at a public company before and you haven't had to do this already and now you're a private company doing the whole dog and pony show all over again, you know, leverage the experience and the reps that other people have had internally or externally to make it as easy as possible. No one wants this to drag on longer than it needs to. Uh, leases isn't the most exciting topic in the world for most people. Um, and so, so yeah, I would just say lean on, lean on strength where it's happened, right? Through experience and technical knowledge and, and make it as easy as possible for you as you go through the process. Great, thanks everybody. Uh, I think we're gonna turn it back over to Marcy for a polling question. Thanks, Teresa. All right, so, as a reminder, we need to answer all polling questions in order to get TPE. So our first polling question is, where are you at regarding the adoption of ASC 842? Option one, have not started at all. Option two, performed pre preliminary research. Option three, partly through the implementation or option four, fully implemented. Give you a few more seconds to get in your votes before we close. We're getting near the end of the year and we wanna get all of that CPE credit we can. All right, I am seeing about 83%. So I'm going to close it in about five seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right, I'm going to close. Oh, I see a few more coming in. All right, so let's close this. And I'm going to share our responses. So, Teresa, do you have any insight on these responses? Yeah, very telling. Um, so, it, it looks like a lot of the folks who have joined the call uh, have done a little bit of preliminary research. And so, um, as it relates to your time on this webinar today, hallelujah, I'm glad you were able to join and get a little bit more information from us. And I hope that the rest of the content will help you through that research. And of course, you can reach out to us uh, afterwards, at the end, you'll see our contact information as well. Let's go ahead and move on now because we've talked about the people side of the equation, and I don't know how much of a surprise it was for you all, um, everything sort of getting dumped on the accounting and finance team, but now let's talk about the process. So how do we get there? Uh, for those of you who haven't even started, this is going to be very helpful, I think. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom to talk about the process. So the, the process, let me preface with this. The process is going to very much depend on how seriously you've taken leases under 840. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to really dictate and kind of help know how um, simple or difficult the process might be going forward as you adopt 842. Grant kind of inferred it earlier, I think, when he said a lot of times it's a real scramble to get a lot of the, the data around the leases together in one place where everyone feels comfortable with the fact that you've got a complete and accurate population. That's one difference between, I'll say 606 and, and leases, right? Is no one typically understating revenue. And so the auditors didn't need to really worry about documenting the completeness of your revenue population. Under leases, you're putting everything onto the balance sheet, whether it be an operating lease or a capital lease. And so the big thing is, 
do you have a big enough asset and a big enough liability going onto the books? And so all of a sudden, completeness and accuracy is, is a key focus during audit procedures to make sure that you've, you've captured everything. Again, from, from projects that we've done recently, I can tell you that some, some companies still have an awful lot of paper records sitting in filing cabinets. Um, some people have got everything nicely in a online repository, whether it be shared network folders, Dropbox, things like that. If you've, if you've done a, a good job of under 840 of keeping all your leases together and being able to put your hands and you know, touch and feel those, this will be a lot simpler because you don't have to go on the, the crazy scramble to find everything and, and feel good about, about that. Um, so that's kind of the, the initial kind of starting point, right, on processes, is making sure that you have everything so that you know what that looks like. Depending on how big that bucket is when you, when you have everything, is then gonna lead to a decision tree and I know we'll talk technology later, as to how much technology is gonna be needed in this process for you to be able to keep accurate books and records, what's the cost benefit of using Excel instead of a, a, a software platform, right, to, to do a lot of this for you, what's the human capital cost of, you know, all of the, the pieces that go into this, and so really that is why the, the inventorying of your lease population becomes so crucial, because if that's incomplete, you're going to be making some significant decisions as you go down the path based on that incomplete data. So, first of all, you get your, your lease population together. It's great. Then you've got to make a decision on, all right, the best way using the information that we have available to us today, this is how we need to launch forward. Uh, you've got some different decisions in, in the A42 timeline that you didn't have under A40. You get away with the old kind of like four test model under A40 for operating capital. All of a sudden, no one really cares about that anymore, right? Because now it's all going on the balance sheet anyway. And a lot of that test was, can we keep this off the balance sheet? Now you've got to worry about, you know, discounting the, the future payments on your leases. Well, that's great, but what discount rate do you use as an entity? Do you need to use different discount rates depending on how your company is structured and the different debt facilities or, or other things available to you? Are you going to go public in the near future potentially, whether it be traditional, SPAC? What's that look like for your, for your future? Do you, do you have an appetite to try and do that? In which case, you may not want to use some of the practical expedients that are available to you, such as using the risk-free rate, because then you would have a, a struggle to unwind them, right, when you become a, a public filer. So process-wise, it's a lot more intensive than 840. I just wanna emphasize that, and while private companies have, I'm gonna kick myself for saying this, private companies as a group have until you are getting audited for your 2022 calendar year end, which means we're about to be truly effective for a lot of private companies on 1-1 on of 2022. Now, a lot of people are going to hear the first part of what I said, which is it's not truly, you know, pen to paper there until the auditors come in. But depending on the company and the investors and the board and how they want to look at information, and again, that public timeline depends on we talked to some private companies that were like, we want to be live with this on 1-1-2022 one, one, so that all of our interim internal reporting is right and accurate and we're forecasting that way. We've had others that say, look, as long as we're there by Q1, we don't care because then we can show Q1 under 842 and everyone gets a level set and what that looks like. Other companies have said, this is fantastic. We are going to wait until November of next year and then we're going to really think about it. I would say, in my own experience, pretty special group that have the capability to wait until November of next year and still get it done in time for your 2022 audit. And I say that being a very special group, you would have to meet a lot of boxes on that checklist of, we literally only have a handful of leases. 
we plan to use Excel, so we're not gonna need any help from any software partners in standing this up and making sure it's all right. We have someone that's actually gonna know what they're doing when it comes to November of next year. They're gonna actually have the time to be able to do this come November of next year, and they're not gonna be worrying about forecasting, budgeting, year-end close, all that fun stuff, right? And so I would say, or I would try and impress that everyone, even if you've got a simple scenario, get it done. No one wants this on the radar on the horizon. Everything that we're hearing from the Armonino side, and I think I'm safe saying from the lease query side, the FASB aren't gonna come riding in again like they did a couple of years ago and push this out. So it's gonna be rubber meets the road come, come 2022. Um, and so people, we get the question a lot, right? Are they gonna kick it out? Are they gonna kick it out? Are we gonna get an extra few months? Are we gonna get an extra year? What if COVID extends, right? I think we're past the point of like COVID concessions on, on lease adoption. Um, so the procrastination period's kind of at, at that end, right? It's the night before the final and everyone's starting to scramble to try and cram for, for the test. Um, I would just say your lives will be a lot easier if you take this process from a strategic business standpoint of being able to you know, really understand the lease population, what exists out there, how can you use the data that you have to collect from 842 to improve future leases. It'll give you more, depending on the, the KPIs and the metrics and everything that people are tracking on the lease portfolio existing, it will give you a better idea of whether you're paying market rate or not for leases as you extend them and renew them and what it needs to look like as you know, as you look to grow space or shrink space and things like that. And to the people aspect that we were just talking about, it gives the company a real opportunity to become cross-functionally communicative and make sure that as a as an entity, you're all swimming in the same direction. You've all got that line of communication open because of this. And it could be a real positive. Could be a check the box for compliance, but it's a real possibility that you can turn this into a an overall kind of positive scenario. Great, Three thanks. Seven. Yeah, no, I think you covered it, and I think you've uh, you've you've covered why it's important to start thinking about it now. Amanda or Grant, do either of you have uh, an additional opinion on why it's good to start this now versus later? I don't. I don't mind starting out, Grant. Um, Go so. For it. Tom has actually walked us through the timeline, but what I'd like to offer with that or alongside it is the concrete um, time period that you should be estimating. Um, a lot of companies underestimate the actual time that it takes. So walking through those steps that Thomas just described, if we think about the first step, education, we already talked about that before and that being a continuous process. And for the most of you that are on the call, you've said that you've already started that research. Typically, you would estimate about two to three weeks for those preliminary conversations, uh, maybe even hosting webinars or attending webinars, such as what we're doing right now. But then you move on to the collection. So the collection of your inventory. And really, I would say that the collection of your inventory is probably one of the challenging parts of the new standard because that incorporates gathering a list of all contracts. And again, hey, departments may not be aware of how a lease is actually defined. So you have to actually go and say, hey, can you actually provide me with all the contracts? And then you have maybe that point person that I alluded to go through and evaluate whether it's going to be a lease that seemed to be in scope. Now, this is going to be a process that what we've seen on average takes about three to four weeks. Um, as you can imagine now, we're already looking at a month and a half into the process. And we've only talked about two steps as of, as of right now. Now, something else to consider is the actual evaluation of your contracts. So going through each of the contracts, evaluating whether this is going to be material or if it isn't. And, and again, the formal process about understanding whether something is going to be necessary from the, the company as a whole. So what are those important requirements? Are you looking for centralization? Are you looking for um, cost efficiencies when you're seeking out maybe a software? So thinking about the evaluation of your leases and the evaluation of a platform, that could take another two to three weeks. And then you have the actual resolution. So 
if you are seeking out software, and that's probably where I come into part here um, with my experience with working at Least Query, you actually initiate the, the reach out of vendors, but more than likely you're going to be talking to more than one vendor. So the actual process that's followed there, follow-up conversations, additional meetings, incorporating additional people, that could take another four to eight weeks. And I haven't even talked about the procurement process, which could be additional time. So when you think about all of those steps that we've described on the front end, you're taking a look at probably about three months, <laughs> give or take, on the, the, the steps that it would take and the proper time period. And we haven't even talked about the resolution of that. So making sure that you're comfortable with those outputs. So if you've decided on a software solution, it's going to be important to actually understand um, that, that everyone internally is comfortable. Uh, that way you're comfortable with describing it to your auditors. So thinking about three or so months is, is, is probably best to, um, I guess, think about for adopting this new standard. And that's why it's best to start a little earlier. Yeah, from an auditor's perspective, I just really want to stress the importance of starting sooner rather than later. Amanda mentioned it, but a lot of folks face a lot of unanticipated challenges when they start implementing uh, Mate 42. Tom mentioned some clients can check you know, very specific boxes, but it'll kick this down to the very last minute. And those are very, really specific defined types of clients. You know, even if you have one or two leases, you know, I've, I've, I just had one client that only had two leases and they chose to early implement 842, a private company, and they started the process a bit later than we had hoped, and we ran into some challenges, especially with the disclosures. A lot of folks forget that 842 comes with a lot of complex disclosures. You're having to disclose a lot of information you previously didn't have to disclose before, and it was a bit of a scramble and fire drill at the end to gather the disclosures to issue the financial statement. So um, from an audit perspective, we feel a lot more comfortable if we start the process sooner rather than later. Yeah, I think, Grant, that covers one of the questions I just wanted to ask, um, and I was going to point this at Tom, but I think you probably answered it as well. Key learning points and takeaways from people, um, companies that you've worked with who have already adopted. So, Tom, I don't know if you have any similar stories. Uh, no, I mean, Grant is a good one. The other thing I'll say is accountants in the U.S. are very used to kind of rules-based guidance, right, when it comes to this. And as the US GAAP and IFRS kind of converge due to that whole effort, um, there's a lot more principle-based elements coming in. And, and so that means there's a lot more judgment that's required from management, which is an uncomfortable situation for a lot of controllers and CFOs because they used to being able to go through that kind of like bright line test. And this this spans beyond just leases, right? But they have to make some judgments and be able to support those judgments to the auditors, such as renewal periods and whether they think that they're reasonably certain to, to trigger renewal periods and leases. That is going to be an ongoing, you see on here, ongoing maintenance. I didn't, with all of my words earlier, I, I didn't even touch on the ongoing maintenance of, you're basically going to have to keep this updated, right, on, on a, say, quarterly or at least annual basis because as your assumptions and changes in the business happen, you're going to have to update things potentially like the term of a lease. And that is going to impact your financial statements and your disclosures. And, and there's a lot of trickle down effect for anyone that is, has been through this has seen. It's not quite as easy as like, great, we've got it on the books. We're done. You're going to need someone that is at least, you know, weeding the garden relate to leases on an ongoing basis. And, and have visibility to, to management um, and get answers from management, right? As to, are we gonna be in this space for three years? Or are we gonna take the renewal option? Cause we know that we're trying to move, I don't know, pre COVID, right? But 2000 people from this office to a new office, like, is that even realistic? Is it something that we're, we're gonna do? So the ongoing maintenance piece is also kind of creeps up on folks because they, they do this slog to get it on the books for day one, but much like going public, right? Day one is, is one thing, but then you've got to do it for day two, day 100, day 300, and, and there's just there's pieces that come with it. And so don't underestimate the, the disclosure element um, that, that Grant kind of touched on a minute ago too. Thanks, Tom. Um, Grant, I, I wanted to ask, 
what additional, I'm just going to guess this is a given, but what additional procedures are your audit teams going to be performing uh, above and beyond what you normally did in the past? Yeah, uh, I think in the past, um, your, your leases might not have been a significant focus of our audit. You know, in most years, we just may get the lease schedule and audit that schedule to make sure the expense and deferred rent balance is accurate. And, and we test the operating lease disclosure, which for the most part has been pretty straightforward. So not a lot of time required to prepare your leases for the auditors, but under the, the new standard, you know, we're going to be placing a lot more emphasis and a lot more scrutiny on your lease, especially during the year of implementation. Uh, so we're just going to be asking for a lot more information. Uh, we want to see your calculations. We want to ask for your lease documents to test. We want to understand your internal controls. You know, what processes did you change to uh, uh, start adopting and, and, and maintaining your lease accounting? Uh, certain large companies, we want to see your memos surrounding lease accounting. So just a lot more things that us auditors will be looking at that you may not be uh, used to um, under 840. Okay. All right. Thanks. I think, uh, Marcy, I think we need to jump into polling question number two. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So for polling question number two, we have When is the effective date of ASC 842 for private companies and nonprofits? Option one, fiscal year begins after December 16th, 2021. Option number two, fiscal year beginning after December 15th, 2021. Option three, fiscal year beginning after July 1st, 2022. Or option four, fiscal years beginning after June 30th, 2022. And just a reminder, we need to answer all polling questions so that we can get that wonderful CPE before the end of the year. I'm seeing about 70% participation, so I'm going to give it just a few more minutes. Get you all the credit we can. All right, I'm going to count down. So five. Four, three, two, one. I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. And let's see our answers. All right, Teresa, do you have any insights on this? Yeah, this is a, this is a bit of a tricky question. So I'm going to turn it over to Grant and Tom to sort of describe this because it doesn't really align with what we were talking about previously. So I'd love to hear what their uh, what their take is on this. Yeah, well, I, I think 69% of the folks got the question right. I mean, the, the, the technical right answer is, is fiscal years beginning after December 15th, 2021. So that would be January 1st, 2022, if you have a 1231 year end. Uh, but for the 23% of the folks, that's technically correct as well if you have a 630 year end. So if you're a nonprofit and you have a 630 year end, then this will go into effect for you starting July 1st, 2022, the first day of your fiscal 2023 year end. Little tricky there. All right, let's keep rolling. I think it's time to start talking about the technology side. We've covered the people, we've covered the process. Moving into technology, I'm gonna turn this over to Amanda. Thanks, Teresa. So. When it comes to technology, technology really plays a vital role in the entire business structure. So when you're thinking about, hey, a specific department who's handling legal, thinking beyond just leases, um, legal has a specific contract management system that helps to initiate their, their, uh, their line of business. When we're thinking about the real estate team, there may be a separate um, technology that they're, they're utilizing as well. So, that isn't anything different that should be seen with leases. Um, just to peel back the layer just a moment, um, I've been working with both public and private companies domestically and internationally over the past few years here at Lease Query as they've been preparing for the new adoption. It's probably safe to say at this point, I've talked to over 1,500 companies. So um, based off of what I've learned, 
everyone is looking for that easy button. Um, so if you could go to, to the next slide there, what you'll see on the screen view is an example of what that looks like from a company standpoint. So we see here with a screenshot, what is the missing piece? So when it comes to lease accounting software, that's going to bridge the gap for your, your general ledger. So when we're thinking about that easy button, everyone is looking for an easy way to generate the journal entries, specifically based off of whatever your company's needs will be. So thinking about, are you posting a journal entry at a consolidated level? Are you posting that based off of each subsidiary? What does that actually entail? We're also thinking about what is the impact to the AP team, um, making sure that they're comfortable with the changes that are getting ready to take place, knowing that, hey, they were responsible for recording the expense and recording the payable, reversing that out once they actually make the payments. If you're choosing a software vendor, that may slightly change. So talking about what those best practices will look like, what the integration process may look like when it comes to actually adopting a uh, software. And then also thinking about, hey, disclosures. <laughs> we've, we've alluded to that here uh, previously as well. Understanding the new disclosures is a vital, <laughs> vital part of that as well. And choosing a software that's going to be able to provide that with a click of a button is, is really going to eliminate the time and effort that, that it would take to go into adopting this new standard. So when you're thinking about being compliant, everyone is working on several projects throughout the entire year. And Thelma actually alluded this as far as the timeline. So you're working on everything in addition to leases. What I've learned from companies based off of my experience is that everyone is looking for an effective and efficient software solution. So this will be the missing puzzle piece in your, your company, understanding whether um, the journal entries are consolidated again or is provided based off of separate segments. Understanding if there's different approaches to establishing your discount rate. Now, if we could talk about the discount rate all day. <laughs> um, the discount rate, in addition to collecting an inventory of leases, is probably the next challenging part of adopting the standard. So Obviously, with uh, those of you who are on the call today, I'm not sure what your portfolio size actually consists of, but if you have, um, let's say, less than 50 leases, maybe you identify a, a single rate for each of your leases. However, if you're getting to 50 or plus, it can be a time-consuming project to actually identify a single rate for each of your leases. So there are different ways to actually apply the rates. So you can apply an incremental borrowing rate, you can apply a risk-free rate as a public company. But what about the actual application of that? You'll see here the portfolio level. So maybe you're finding groupings, maybe that's according to set entities or subsidiaries, or now with the more recent um, turn of events with the board, um, having the ability to elect the risk-free rate by class of asset. So all of these details will make it a lot easier for you adopting the standard and having those conversations with vendors as you're seeking out, that will also be important. We should also consider what is the impact of changes in the future? So everyone wants to think about the, the, the actual adoption date, but what about day two accounting? So understanding that you may be faced with modifications um, that could be just due to the normal business structure or it could be due to the current environment. No one was expecting the changes due to um, COVID-19, so um, we, we had to shift. So there will be changes that you'll have to encounter and having a vendor that can quickly make those changes and be abreast of um, what the current guidance says as it states with the, the normal framework of modifications will be important. And then lastly, if you're thinking about um, those who have a hands-on leases um, other than the accounting department, thinking about those functional requirements. What about um, leases that are getting ready to expire or alerting those people of those pending changes or those next action items will all be a vital role in how technology plays a, a role in your business and specifically when it comes to the adoption of, of, of ASC 842. Amanda, that's very helpful. Hey, Grant, you're, put your auditor hat back on here for a second and tell me about how comfortable you are with your clients that are um, going to be keeping all of this in Excel. Okay. 
Yeah, that's a good question because I come across a lot of clients that uh, want to use Excel. Look, Excel is great. It's a it's a very powerful tool. Um, it can do a lot. I think many of us are very comfortable using Excel. But the challenge that you know we, we come across a lot is that people want to use Excel for everything, and Excel can do many things, but it's not really built to maintain uh, the accounting for a large lease portfolio. And from my perspective, Excel could work if you have a nominal number of leases, but once you get over you know 10, 20, 50 leases, then you really need to start thinking about implementing some sort of lease software. Um, I've had some clients that have over 50 leases and in our initial conversations, they've thought about using Excel and, and that's certainly not recommended. Um, but if you go down that path and you wanna use Excel, you know, we as your auditors are gonna be placing a lot more focus and the risk of our audit is going to be a lot higher. Um, be, uh, uh, the, the risk assessment of lease is going to be a lot higher just because there's some uh, you know, inherent limitations in using mm -hmm. Excel. Um, you know, there could be problems with the formulas. If the calculations are linked, you know, one accidental keystroke could ruin the entire workbook. So data integrity is an issue and just inherently gives rise to a higher risk of human error. So we would just feel a lot more comfortable as your auditors if you're using a lease software, and especially if that lease software is from a reputable vendor. That certainly would reduce our risk assessment over uh, uh, your lease accounting. Yeah, and I guess I would add that I don't see Excel handling the reporting disclosures and ad hoc reporting out of those Excel spreadsheets either. I didn't even think about that. Tom, um, give us an easy button. How do you go about advising clients on the selection process, like the evaluation of leave it in Excel or put it in software, and then what, what are best practices for picking a solution? Yeah, uh, and first, let me just pick back off of something that, that Grant touched on, right? And I know, Teresa, I've worked with you for, for a while now, and we've had some A42 projects where they wanted a proposal both doing this project in Excel versus using a, a platform. We described to them to we were blue in the face that Excel was not the right choice for them because they had 200 or so assets and 200 like individual leases and, and more assets beyond that. They wanted to know how much it would cost in Excel versus a, a software platform and they were not happy when the price was higher in Excel than it was for a software platform but it's for that very reason that Grant touched on, right? We've got to make sure that all of this is flowing the right way through the workbook and, and make sure we can lock it down in a way that a software platform has already perfected. There's, I mean, they already have controls in place that we could do an awful lot of things, but Grant as the audit has still got to come in and make sure that we do it and, and that comfort level still isn't there. So um, I would say some, some obvious ones would be, as, as you go about the, software platform, right? Think about your um, fiscal calendar. Do you do, you know, the, like the manufacturing um, calendar, like 544? If so, does the platform drive with that? What ERP are you in and what kind of native plugins does the, the software platform have to your ERP so that if you want to push journal entries directly from, you're saying like your leasing subledger, right, into your ERP, does it, does it do that? How nice, sounds really kind of silly, but like how nice is the user interface at putting information in? Do they have like an Excel template? And I realize this sounds ridiculous after what we've just said about Excel, but do they have like a bulk upload template in Excel that's gonna ease the getting the information into the database? That's great, that's step one, right? But then how easy is it and what the controls in place but making changes and how easy is it to make changes in the system as things happen as we all know they all do how easy is it to navigate is it a ridiculous number of clicks just to do make the simplest of changes how good are the alerts i mean one of the things that amanda mentioned the pending changes i've worked with least query from a, an operational side one of the nice things is it will automatically send you a note that says, by the way, lease ABC in San Francisco is going to expire in 90 days. Do you need, are you going to extend, do you, are you taking this renewal option? It will house 
kind of extra information about the leases. So it's not a pure lease accounting platform. It is a lease repository and library of leases that will include abstracts and key terms so that if you're needing to pull information out, it just makes everyone's life easier. We all know that everyone sends the email requesting information out of the system at the last minute, right? And so can you actually pivot and get what they need out of the system? Um, obviously cost is always a, a, an element of the selection, but based on what we've seen, if you need someone full-time dedicated to leases and just leases because of the load, you're better off getting the software and having that person 20% dedicated to leases because you're going to be able to do a lot more of a value with that person than you would if you were just trawling through Excel and, and playing workbook jockey. Um, and so again, it comes back to maybe the strategy side as much as the compliance side. Um, there will be many people that will ignore us, we've learned, right? And, and go with Excel and, and go with it anyway. Um, I mean, heck, we have clients that basically use Excel as their ERP. It's not made <laughs> to be an ERP either, but here we are, right? So um, I just think there's, you know, there's some real value from the software. It, it's not free, so clearly there's a cost there that you have to consider, but I think it, it really gives you a level up on how well you can do this on an ongoing basis. Awesome. Great recommendations about how to, uh, how to pick an e uh, a lease system. I think uh, Marcy's gonna jump us into our third polling question and we've gotta get through one more after that. So Marcy, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. All right, so with our third polling question, we are asking, um, how many leases are in your company's portfolio? Option one, less than 11. Option two, 11 to 101, option three, 101 to 1,000, or option four, more than 1,000. And if you don't know how many leases are in your portfolio, do your best guess. You wanna put in some answers so you get that CPE credit that we all so desperately need. I'm seeing about 80% participation, so I'm gonna give you a few more moments to join in and vote. All right, I'm gonna count us down at five, four, three, two, one, two. Oh, I'm seeing it jump again. I'll give you a few more seconds. Two, one. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll and see our results. All right, so interesting. So uh, a good portion, are between you know the zero to a hundred, and then we've got one that's more than a hundred. Um, I would say that uh, a very good portion of you should at least consider looking at software. Um, also, it's important to note that if you don't know how many leases you have, or you're unsure if you've got the right number in this amount that you've quoted here. A uh, little quick tip for you, it is budget season for many of you who are on the phone and you might even be at the wrap up point, but reaching out to each of those department heads to get a handle on those leases, this is a really good time to be able to communicate. Uh, but let's move on to our next slide. I think right now we are moving into uh, our wrap up here. I'd like very brief top three takeaways. You don't want people to leave this webinar without remembering. Uh, I'm gonna start with Amanda. Sure, so top three, number one, recognizing the time that it takes to actually implement the new standard, understanding that, hey, you were provided with delays um, prior to, that was for a reason, so getting started early is advised. Ensuring that you have at least one person that's acting as a support or the liaison between the entire company to ensure that you have a smooth process to reach you to the reconciliation of understanding the maintenance of your lease and leases and the balances. And then finally, knowing that software is going to make your job a lot easier. Um, everyone was probably uh, 
confused about computers back in the day, but computers have turned around to be something that's vital for everyone. So I would, I would encourage that same type of interaction when it comes to adopting this new Lisa County standard by retaining your journal entries and your disclosures by a click of a button. Thank you. Grant, your top three takeaways. Uh, I would say start the process now, uh, make this an entity-wide project, and uh, third, don't go about this alone. Leverage your friendly auditors and consultants to help you with this process. Wonderful. All right, Tom. It was the nicest way of telling me to use less words, Teresa. Um, <laughs> so I would say be, try and be strategic with it, right? It's a check the box exercise from a compliance aspect, but you can do more with it if you think about it and you actually start you know, sooner rather than later. Uh, outside of that, I would just echo my, my friendly panelists here, um, you know, use your auditors, start soon, leverage technology where it makes sense. I mean, all of it comes together, right? Um, but yeah, we're, we're around if anyone needs, anyone needs to, to bounce ideas off of us, even just on an informal basis. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Marcy, I think we've got one uh, final uh, polling question here, and then I do have just a couple of questions that have come in. So let's go to our polling question number four and let everybody answer that to get their CPE. Yeah, let's get this last one in. So our last polling question of the webinar is what type of solution or technology are you planning to utilize for the adoption of ASC 842? Option one, lease accounting software. Option two, Excel. Oh no, option three, outsource, or option four, other. All right, I'm seeing the polls jump up, so I'm gonna give you just another moment to get that CPE credit in. All right, I'm gonna close the poll in three, two, one. And let's see these results. Yep. That's kind of what I expected. And I think, you know, as you go through your research process, you know, continue to determine where you stand in, the, in your lease count, your inventory, um, and for sure reach out to us if you have any questions, concerns about how you're planning to implement it. And, and as uh, everybody's mentioned, reach out to your auditors as well. So thanks for participating in the polling questions. Um, I do see some questions coming in, so I'm going to read those out here and see if the panelists have answers. Um, the first question is around the skill set that might be required. You mentioned um, having sort of a leader or somebody who understands lease accounting, but um, to guide through the process, what skill set would be required? I would say having the ability to research <laughs> um, is definitely going to be vital because um, while we are providing webinars like this one to, to show you as an example, it really comes with diving into the standard itself, maybe following up with interpretive guidance from various firms to understand how that relates to your leases. So you may discover various nuances that um, you have to read through examples that are provided. So having the ability to research is going to be important as well as the ability to document the information. So as I alluded to before, that person will also be more than likely responsible for establishing what that new process looks like internally, knowing that everyone is going to be working together to accomplish this common goal, not only for the adoption, but moving forward for any new leases that you enter into as well. Great, thank you. Um, we've got one last question that I have time to ask, um, and then we're gonna have to drop off. Um, rent concessions. During COVID, a lot of landlords granted rent concessions. Was there, uh, does anybody have any comments about how that might be impacted on the standard? I, I can hop in and basically say a lot of it comes down to if the, the cash flows got changed as a result of those concessions. If they did, then effectively you're looking at a lease modification. If they didn't, and it was more of just an extension or, or changing of payment terms, but overall outlay remains the same, no change. So it's very specific in terms of what the concessions look like. Um, but let's say at 10,000 foot, considering we're running out of time, that, that's the overall kind of summary. Thank you. All right, we've got um, some additional resources available to everybody. Um, this is the 
a way to contact our team members and we've got some frequently asked questions on our web page. We've got some white papers. We've got additional webinars that we've done previous to this one and, and this one will be posted as well. So if you're looking for more information, uh, please feel free to click on the links that are included in this that will be emailed to all of you within 48 hours. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to Marcy for getting us rolling. I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.